Okay, yesterday we read chapter 15 of To Kill a Mockingbird, which involved a scene where a lynch mob shows up for Atticus uh, attempting to get to Tom Robinson, and they had no problem going through Atticus, and his big concern was either that his kids would be hurt or killed or that they would watch him be hurt or killed while trying to stand up for what he believed in. This is a scene in the book But it is something that comes straight out of real life, and this is one of those uncomfortable conversations that we need to have. We take these things that happen in real life, and if we continue to pretend that they never happen or that they don't exist, then we never get anywhere farther from them. So today, what we are going to do is we're going to have an uncomfortable conversation about extremist violence and how it happens. This includes not only incidents that have actually happened, but why they happen, and some of the understandings of what we can do in order to prevent them from happening. So I want to be very clear on this. Uh, What we're about to talk about is a lot of behaviorism, and it's a very, very, very big, very involved topic. So the stuff that we're going to be going over is just the very tip of the iceberg. It doesn't even come close uh, to being encompassing or comprehensive, but hopefully it can help give you an idea about the issue, about what's involved in the issue, and maybe it might drive you to look a little bit deeper. It's also important, I want to point out, because there are several links at the end that are involved in an assignment that we'll talk about when we get there, so make sure that you stick around for that because that is going to be important. For now, uncomfortable conversations, extremist violence, and how it happens, how this matters. In chapter 15 of To Kill a Mockingbird, Atticus intercedes with a lynch mob on behalf of Tom Robinson. While lynch mobs, at least currently, aren't as prevalent as they once were, they do still exist. They're sung about in Toby Keith songs. They're depicted as heroic in westerns where they're described as Texas justice. And they're made fun of in popular culture. The truth, however, is that it's often so ugly that it's ignored. We don't like to look at what actually happens with these things. Instead, we treat them uh, as vigilante justice that you might see on the Western frontier or as a way to try to take back the streets from those gangsters or criminals. But there is a long history of exactly why we in this country are supposed to uh, fall in the justice system instead of taking things into our own hands. And what can happen when we allow people to do this with impunity, when we allow anybody who wants to, to use their prejudices or their beliefs and act as judge, jury, and executioner. Let's look at real life examples and what we need to know about them. Again, these are just a couple of very famous examples. There are thousands of them all over the country, all over the world, spanning from the foundings of America, even currently to today. So the first one that we want to talk about is James Byrd Jr., who is a man who was walking home in Texas one night. Uh, He was picked up by three white supremacists who chained him to the back of their truck and then uh, dragged him down a gravel road until he eventually hit a culver, which uh, decapitated and killed him. So this is one example where it wasn't so much that he was taken out and uh, lynched from a tree, but... Rather, he was tortured and killed in a different way for nothing more than the color of his skin, and some people decided they wanted to take it out on him. We also have the case of Emmett Till, who was a boy walking in the South, and the accusation uh, brought about by Carolyn Dunham, uh, who is here on the right, was that he had whistled, said vulgar things to her, and made sexually suggestive Uh, comments towards her and her brother and I want to say her fiance uh, went out and committed atrocious acts where they beat Emmett Till to death this 14 year old boy he was horribly tortured and mutilated and his body was later found his mother Mammy Till famously had an open casket funeral where Jet Magazine picked up the story and ran the photographs of what had happened to him uh, all over the country and caused 
outrage. So here is another example of this, and possibly the biggest, uh, most hard to deal with part of this, um, among all of the the horrors, just the extra twist of the knife, was that Caroline Donham later came out and said that she'd fabricated the entire incident. She'd made it in, up entirely. So Emmett Till, all this horrible stuff had happened to him, and he never even knew why because he didn't do anything wrong. He was accused of something for no reason. We had Matthew Shepard, who in 1998 was a gay student at the University of Wyoming. He was in Laramie, Wyoming at a bar, and uh, two men picked him up, drove him out into the country where they beat him with their with pistols, took his shoes, tied him to a fence, and he froze nearly to death. He was finally found the next day, uh, almost dead from exposure and from the beatings that he had received, and he died in the hospital. Here are so these are three examples of the atrocities that can occur with lynch mobs and with extremist violence. We also have other examples of this, including Dylan Roof, where uh, he walked into a black church in uh, North Carolina, I want to say, and uh, shot up several parishioners because he was of the opinion that this was something that he was supposed to do. So not only do these uh, things take the form of going out and picking a lone victim and causing them grievous harm or death uh, for whatever reason it is that they might use to justify it, but we can also see that there are other examples that are directly related to this where somebody decides instead of going after a lone victim, they are going to create a bigger source of injury, of, of hurt, of pain, of mass terror from their actions. While it's good to be educated in these things and to be aware that these are things that can and do happen, just being educated isn't enough. We also have to talk about why they happen and how we can try to avoid them in the future. So again, we're going to go over some of the very basics here but it's nowhere near comprehensive. There's a lot more to learn and a lot more to discuss, but this might just be the tip of the iceberg that helps uh, generate at, at least a little bit of education so we can be aware of these things. How does this happen? Well, like everything else in life, it's complicated. Nobody wakes up in the morning and decides that they are going to go commit a hate crime out of nowhere. There's a process that's involved, and once we learn to recognize that process, we can start breaking it down and prevent these things from happening in the future. So we have to look at this very, very complicated subject, and we can break it down into a few different things that we can talk about. The first one is that it often involves a genetic component. And each of these we're going to talk about more in depth, so please don't confuse this with saying that these are all-encompassing or that there's one-size-fits-all solution to any of this. So genetics, stressors, toxic enculturation, which we'll explain when we get there, indoctrination, and aggrandizement. When we describe what, involve, what gets people involved in extremist movements and what leads people to commit hate crimes, these are often the things that law enforcement looks at. When the FBI uh, talks about uh, extremist groups, these are some of the factors, the risk factors they look at for wh who is likely to join these groups and who is likely to be uh, indoctrinated and commit acts of violence and acts of terror. So we need to take a closer look at each of these because it's not just enough to name them. We also have to know what they are and how they influence people. So the first thing we want to talk about is genetics. Genetics makes up all of us. It's the building blocks for our cells. It's the building blocks for our bodies. It influences everything about us. But there's a lot that goes into it. There's a reason it's entire fields of studies with volumes of literature on. So let's just talk a little bit about it and why it might be important. How does it work? Genetics may control chemical and biological process, including responses to stimuli. When things happen to us, our genetics are often at the forefront of the way that we might react to them because they decide how much uh, serotonin is released in the brain, how much adrenaline or epinephrine, 
how much cortisol is released and how does our brain react to these things flooding in. But there's also a lot more than that. It's not just enough to say, take a genetic panel of somebody and suddenly we can know everything about them because there's so much more that goes into it than that. So the degrees to which the genes have an effect can be controlled by environmental factors, previous experience and epigenetics. That are those outside influences that cause genes to start and start working or stop working. So there's a lot that goes into this. But what do the genes themselves control? Well, this is just an example. Again, there's a huge comprehensive list of the different things that different genes and genetic markers have to do with behavior. But as an example, they can control our ability to communicate through the FOXP2 gene. People that have trouble communicating often deal with antisocial behavior, frustration. They don't necessarily know how to communicate those things that they deal with on a daily basis which often causes them to lash out. So FOXP2 gene is one example of how genetics can control this or contribute to this. There's also a genetic marker or a gene for depression, which is the H5TT gene. And there's a lot more that goes into this because the H5TT gene, along with these other genes, and I, again, I'm not going to get too complicated. I'm not going to, this isn't a course in genetics. This is just bringing up some basic stuff. But the H5TT gene is triggered by childhood trauma, which we'll talk about here in a minute, also as a huge impact and factor in who joins extremist groups and who commits hate crimes. There's genes like the COMT gene or the OTR gene, which control anger and aggression. And those also are triggered by childhood abuse by exposure to alcoholism or chronic drug abuse. There's a lot of things that go into this, which is why we can't just take a genetic panel of somebody and decide, okay, this is, uh, you're more likely to have issues dealing with and regulating anger and aggression, so therefore you're going to commit a hate crime. It doesn't work like that. As we grow up, we experience different environmental factors which may trigger the genes like we talked about. Our previous experience helps us learn to do things like regulate emotionally. Um, poverty is a big factor in the way that these genes are expressed and the way that they carry over into our real world actions. When we have people who uh, don't necessarily have to worry so much about, say, mealtimes or eating, uh, it can help a lot with dealing with emotional regulation because you learn to be patient rather than be concerned over where your next meal is coming from. So that's one way in which childhood trauma can affect, um, can affect the genes and the expression of the genes. Additionally, having correct modeling for behavior can make a big difference. Uh, if you have one of these genes but you grow up in an environment where physical violence is not an acceptable way to express yourself, you learn to regulate your emotions a lot better. We also learn to regulate through our personal experiences. Somebody that grows up in a very diverse community is much less likely to commit a hate crime, especially against the members that they interacted with on a daily basis. On the other hand, if you have somebody that grows up in a very insular community where everybody looks and acts the same, they might have a much more difficult time uh, handling the different genetics that control, say, anger and aggression or mental illness. So I don't, I want to make sure it's very clear that your genetics do not necessarily control who you are. We are all uh, very complex and way more involved than just the genetic markers on a piece of paper. It's way more complicated than that. But they do give us a, a reason to look at somebody and we can start to get the idea of some of the issues that they might be struggling with. And that gives us a better idea of what kind of supports they might need. And again, poverty conditions can exacerbate. There's all sorts of problems with growing up in poverty that can cause any number of issues with these genetic, uh, it, with these genetic markers and with these genetic factors. And education and therapeutic techniques can help. The more you know and the more you get to practice at being able to regulate these things, the easier time you're going to have. So it's not just that. The way that the FBI phrases it when they talk about uh, people who are likely to become involved in hate crimes is that they describe genetics as a handgun. They're there, 
and they can influence things, but just by itself, sitting on a table, it's not much of a threat. It takes more than that in order to activate how dangerous it can be. We also have stress. Here we have a copy of Maslow's Hierarchy of Needs, which is a very important psychological concept, which talks about the different needs that we need to have in order to become our best selves. And what Maslow realized when he was creating this is that there are different needs that we have that have to be met, and each one is based on the need below it. Uh, for instance, that, that bottom one, air, water, food, shelter, sleep, clothing, those are all things that we have to have, most of which if we don't have, we are flat going to die. If you don't have water or food, if you don't get sleep, you're going to die. If you don't have air, you're going to die. So if one of those is missing, that is your immediate need that you have to fix before you can do anything else. Once you have those met, you can move up the chain to safety needs. Are you safe currently? Um, do you have employment? Do you have income? Are you sick? Do you have those resources that you need in order to be safe? Once you have that, you can move up. You can get into the friendship, family, sense of connection, this connection to your community. So people who have concerns with those physiological needs, if you are concerned about getting enough food, it's really hard to build up a sense of friendship with somebody. If you are constantly kept in that state where you're concerned about safety and physiological needs, then it's really, really hard to develop a connection with somebody. We also have above that even, once we have those community ties, once we have friends around us, we can develop our sense of respect, our self-esteem, our status, recognition, everything that we might personally want that makes us feel good about ourselves. Finally, once all those are met, we can reach that top one, that self-actualization, which is building yourself into a better person, deciding to uh, actively take classes or learn new things or learn new skills. We have to have each of these components met before we can get to the next one. So when somebody is dealing with poverty, those physiological needs and the safety needs that come along with that, it becomes very, very difficult to get to those top parts. That stress makes somebody very susceptible to dealing with antisocial behaviors, negative social interaction. People are much more likely to get involved in drugs and alcohol dependency because they try to self-medicate. People are much, much more likely to lash out in anger because we look at those things like displaced anger and what happens when you feel your control is taken away by something that you can't strike back at. You end up looking for a target that you can strike back at. So when we see people who are uh, the most likely to get involved in extremist groups or to commit dangerous antisocial crimes, we have to look at these basic things. How can we avoid that? We can do that by addressing some of their physiological and safety needs so that they can better uh, focus on those things that they might need, love and belonging and self-esteem, self-actualization rather than constantly feeling injured and on edge and like they need to find a target for their aggression and their anger. There's a bunch of different types of stressors. Some of these we all go through every day. And again, these are complicated. It's not that anybody that goes through any of these stressors is going to go out and commit a hate crime. But when we go back to that analogy of the gun on the table being genetics, certain types of stressors, once you have that gun, they enable somebody to pick up the gun. This is step two, is when you add in these stress. We have internal stressors. These are self-expectations, unmet desires, the ability to self-regulate, and mental health. People who suffer from depression and anxiety are more likely to be open to outside influence by groups that might try to recruit them for extremist mentalities. If you have an unmet desire, and you can't figure out why you are not happy all the time, then all somebody has to do is come along and offer you that key to happiness, and you are much more likely to be open to manipulation. We also have our self-expectations. Again, these kind of all fit in together as internal stress that we put on ourselves. We have external stress. These are things that you don't necessarily control, but that come from outside of you, things like the economy, Things like your relationships, your personal stability. Do you have a job? Can you get a job? When people are kept in unstable environments, especially through these external stressors, it again makes them very susceptible to harm or injury or manipulation. 
We have environmental stressors. We have home life, culture, abuse. So these are things that are those external stressors, but instead of being acute stressors, those things that might happen very quickly and then it's over, like a, a breakup or um, your house burning down. These are things that are going to be consistently ongoing. Um, if your culture is constantly stressful to you and abusive to you because you feel like you don't fit into it, then that is going to be an ongoing stress. Same thing with uh, toxic home life or abuse. These things can cause extreme stress and they come up over and over again when we look at people that have been involved in extremist movements or committed hate crimes. These are some common things that we see. And then finally, your knowledge of coping strategies. If you don't have coping strategies, people are much more likely to get involved in drug or alcohol abuse. They're more likely to get involved in violent relationships or being the one that commits violence against others. They might lack speaking skills and have trouble expressing themselves. This is part of why we focus so hard on reading, writing, speaking, and listening in English. Because if we can teach you how to communicate your stress to other people, you're much less likely to internalize it and take it out on somebody that you don't mean to because you know how to talk out your problems. So we focus on all of these. But again, these can be exacerbated by genetics, by poverty, by all sorts of things. So we look at these stressors. This is a big influence in who goes out to commit hate crimes. Then we have toxic enculturation. Enculturation is a process by which a person adopts the behavior pattern of the culture that they live in. None of us are born knowing everything about our culture. We have to learn that over time. And if you move, you have to start this process over and over again. Even in Kansas, uh, I have lived in small towns, and they have a very different culture than living in the big city. So you have to learn about those expectations behind us. We also have to build up our social capital so that the way that we interact with people becomes more stable, more firm as they learn about us, and we learn about what our expectations are and how to build those up. Toxic enculturation, however, happens when the culture that you're living in or the culture that you're becoming involved in stresses a lot of toxic behaviors, sometimes some things like aggression, violence, drug use, alcohol use, us versus them mentality. So if the culture is big into these things, then it becomes extremely dangerous because you are much more likely to try to also emulate those things in order to regain social status. If you move, say, to a community where the white supremacy movement is very, very heavy, you tend to become inculture, uh, enculturated in that society, even if you don't mean to. You start using language that you wouldn't otherwise use. You start committing actions that you wouldn't otherwise do. And it becomes a very gradual step-by-step -step process where you try to fit in better with the culture. Humans are social creatures. We have to adopt to culture, otherwise we get cast out and we die on our own in the wilderness. There's safety in numbers. This goes back thousands of years. So in order to maintain our safety, we have to ingrain with the culture. And when that culture is bad, when it's toxic, it can be extremely harmful. So we also want to talk about social capital and standing that goes with that toxic enculturation. So cultures have different values, both positive and negative. We might view um, a certain religious tradition as being important to a culture. We might view things like sharing or understanding or engaging in cultural activities. Um, where I'm from in Emporia, we have a big bike race every year that everybody comes out and uh, participates in um, either as a competitor or as I am um, a spectator. It's community wide. We draw people from all over the world. So everybody is involved in this um, in some aspect or another. Even if you have no interest in biking, just coming out and enjoying the day with the community is a really, really big thing. So that can be an example of a positive value. If, however, you get involved in a culture that does those negative things, this can go the other direction and you become very absorbed in that culture. So in ins insular communities, toxic traits can be exacerbated to extreme levels. If you live in a community uh, where what's valued is how tough you are, and you're constantly being told you have to go out and prove your toughness, you're much more likely to engage in physical violence in that community in order to maintain your standing and show everybody, I belong here. 
And if a community places social currency and standing on toxic traits, they can encourage those to grow without also encouraging them to be checked. We see this a lot of times when we look at people that have been radicalized like Dylan Roof, is that they became slowly involved in toxic communities, uh, white power and white extremist communities, because they didn't feel like they had a place in a community outside of this. So they just kept getting involved in that and kept one-upping themselves more and more and trying to become more ingrained in this community by committing more and more extremist and violent acts. It might start out with just posting something on an internet message board. And then you receive rewards and feedback from that from people who agree with you. So you do it again and again. And then you go out and you start saying this to people in person. And if you have a system that backs you up, you have people say, yeah, good job. You definitely should have said that to that person. Um, even if it's a horrible thing to say, you're going to repeat those actions. And it escalates slowly and slowly and slowly until people are committing violent and extremist actions because they feel like that's what they have been taught to do, even if they're not doing it intentionally. This can also lead to a toxic race to the bottom. This is particularly where social standing needs to be constantly reinforced. Who can commit the most extreme action? Who's going to show how dedicated they are to the cause? Who is going to go commit the most heinous crime? Who is willing to go to jail for their beliefs? When you get into toxic culture, you see these things come up over and over and over again. We see this in gang cultures. We see this in supremacy cultures. We see this in misogyny cultures. We see this all over. We also get into indoctrination. Now, indoctrination, I did not put a picture on here because I could not find one that wasn't just absolutely appalling. So instead, let's talk about what indoctrination is. Indoctrination is the process of teaching a set of values held to be important by a cultural subset. So you join a group. This is your education process of becoming involved in that group. This is part of the aculturization or enculturization, excuse me. So the internet allows for greater access to echo chambers, indoctrinating material, and extremist information. The internet can be a great place. It can allow you to communicate and to connect with people who are like you and help us to build and understand across the divide, across the whole world that we're not that different, to allow us to discuss our problems and find better solutions to them to help us move forward. But it also exposes you to people that disagree with you. And if you don't know how to handle that, it can become very easy to instead just get into an echo chamber where you only talk to people who agree with you. So if you get involved in that, you think that you're always right, even when you're not. It allows access to these indoctrinating materials so you become exposed to new ideas that also may be extremely harmful. This is entirely how cults and white supremacist movements work. And also allows you access to extremist information that you otherwise wouldn't have had. I grew up in the 90s, and we definitely had a presence of, say, the Ku Klux Klan in my hometown. We would see their graffiti sometimes. We knew that they existed out there. But if you'd have asked me where to find information about them, I would have had no idea. I knew that they were there, but I didn't know anybody who was involved in the Klan. I didn't know if you wanted, for some reason, to get involved in them, where you would go or who you would talk to. I had no idea. But then the Internet came out, and all I have to do is go to a search engine type it in, and I'm going to find materials relating to whatever it is that I want. I'm going to find access to websites like Stormfront where you get some of the worst examples of uh, how people behave and treat each other. I can find that with the touch of a couple buttons. And if you are, say, a middle schooler, a high schooler, who doesn't feel like you fit in with other people, it can become very easy to find a group of people who are willing to give you a place where you can fit in if you are willing to deal with their horrible, toxic evilness. If you are a person that lacks a community, that can be a very strong draw. People are amazingly willing to put up with things if they feel like their reward for being involved in it outweighs what they have to get put up with. That's why people uh, would join fraternities, even though there was horrible hazing rituals before that was made illegal. That's why people would uh, go through military boot camp, which is notoriously difficult because they believe that the reward for what they're doing is worth the pain and suffering that they go through. 
And this isn't pro or anti-military. That's just using that as an example. People are willing to put up with a lot in order to go through something that they think will be worth it in the end. When we don't have access to critical thinking skills, the ability is to ask those hard questions, to ask, how do we know this is true? Or why would somebody do this? A person can become radicalized and indoctrinated easier, especially if that indoctrination leads to social currency. So if you are rewarded for the more loyal you are and the less questions you ask, you're going to continue those things, which means it's very hard to get out of it. And the earlier the exposure to indoctrination, the more likely that you'll get actions that go along with it. We see this with kids. When kids become involved in extremist movements at a young age, uh, anywhere from 7 to you know, 18 to their late 20s, they are more likely to commit violent actions in the name of that cause because you've been caught early and your brain isn't fully developed and you're more likely to not understand the consequences of your actions. You're more likely to be uh, swayed into things that you wouldn't normally do. This is an entire concept behind peer pressure. That's not to say that older people are completely immune to it. They're just less likely. Finally, there's aggrandizement. We look at that root where they're grand. So aggrandizement is the belief that you are special, you are superior, you are better than everybody else. And it doesn't necessarily mean egomaniacs. It means realizing that maybe you are the one that everybody is looking for. You can gain uh, social currency and acceptance by doing what other people aren't willing to do because you are special. That is a big thing that recruiters for white supremacy movements and cults look for, is who wants to feel like they're special because they are willing to do the most extreme actions in order to make everybody else happy and look at them and applaud them. You'd also view this as the need for a hero. So as rhetoric, that's language, stress, access to these antisocial communities, and the perception of out th outside threats escalate, so too does the call for hero intervention. Every time that there is a national emergency and people are stressed, especially if it's economic or especially if it involves the health and safety of a mass number of people, what usually follows along are conspiracy theories and people that suggest that we need a hero to come save us from these dangerous times. We need somebody who is willing to go out and commit an action in order to protect us from the immigrants or the Jews or the blacks or whoever else it is. We need somebody who is willing to do that. Boy, I sure wish there was somebody who would do that. And if you are a person who is particularly susceptible to these things uh, because you don't have access to a community on your own and you really want to show how important you are to this community, this can be a big concern because people look at this and they say, I could be that, that hero that everybody needs. That's me. I'm special. So people with poor impulse control or a social value that's tied to toxic, toxic enculturation and social stature or those who lack an outside support structure often view the call for heroes as their chance to be important. I can be important. I can be that hero you're looking for. And if that call for a hero is met with access to weapons or the ability to create weapons, because they don't just have to be a knife or a gun, it could be a bomb, uh, it could be any number of things, it could be a rope or a garrote or anything, it creates both a desire to take action and the means to do so. We need a hero to protect us from the black community, and I have a gun, so I'm going to walk into a church and I'm going to be that hero. And then everyone will see how important and how awesome I am. That's the exact mindset behind people like Dylan Roof. It's not that they wake up and say, I'm going to be the evil villain today. They say, I'm going to be the hero that protects us from the threat because I'm the only one willing to do this while those other cowards just sit by. We see this because we talk to people who are involved in white power movements. We talk to people who commit these atrocities. And we say, what led you to do this? And usually that's the same answer. I was angry. And I didn't know what else to do, and I thought this was my chance to be special and important. 
It's most likely to occur with young men, but it's not exclusive to that group. And we could get into all sorts of reasons for this. And it would be an entire lecture that would take way more time than we have. So this isn't about uh, assigning blame or picking out the reasons why young men uh, seem to be the most susceptible to these things. But just to make everybody aware that it is more likely to be young men that commit these acts. But it doesn't have to be exclusively then, because there are plenty of instances of women doing this as well. There's plenty of instances of older men doing these as well. There's plenty of instances of all sorts of different people committing these crimes, but it's not just um, it's not just this one group, even though it is most likely. Great. We've talked about this. We understand what leads people to commit these acts, at least in this very basic brief moment. Why do we need to know this? What's the point of all this? Does it excuse people's actions if we understand that they went through abuse as a child? Does it excuse people's actions if they were involved in substance abuse or if they felt like they needed a community? Of course not. Of course it doesn't. But what we can do is have more understanding so that we can try to avoid these things from happening in the future. By understanding the factors that are needed to cajole people into committing these acts of violence, we know when to look for them and how to avoid them. We can see the warning signs before somebody goes and commits an act of hate. We can understand that in times of stress, people are much more likely to commit dangerous actions. So we know to be more careful during those times of stress. We know that poverty is likely to exacerbate it. So if everybody in a community has lost their job because, say, a, a plant closed down or something has gone wrong or there's a pandemic that has shut down stores, that people are angry and they're scared and they're more likely to commit these acts. So we know to be careful. And we can also look for ways that we can help alleviate the risk. Extremist groups work by catching people at their most vulnerable and exchanging hope and stability for service. I know you're scared. I know you're hurt right now and I can fix all your problems. I just need you to do something for me. I need you to give me money. I need you to go attack this person. I need you to go uh, prove how loyal you are by spray painting a swastika on a synagogue. As we all have times where we experience stress, it's important to know who might take advantage of us. When we're stressed, the first part of our brain, our prefrontal cortex at the very beginning of our head, the, brain, the part of the brain that's responsible for decision making and for understanding the consequences of our actions, that tends to get shut down. And so people who are looking to manipulate us, they'll look for those times because they can get you to do stupid things. They can get you to make mistakes. They can get you to do actions that you otherwise wouldn't commit. So if I'm aware that I'm under stress, I can also be more aware of what might happen if I don't stop and critically think about what people are asking of me. It can help break down barriers that prevent people from escaping violent mindsets or groups. As weird as it is, as it is to think, not everybody involved in supremacist groups want to be involved in the supremacist group. Sometimes if that is your entire group of friends or the culture that you've grown up in, you don't know how to get out of it because that's all you know. So by being aware of these things, we can help people escape from these traps. That doesn't mean that you have to go out and become friends with your local KKK group or uh, Aryan Nations group or Aryan Brotherhood or whatever it is. But it lets us know that there is hope for somebody that's involved in those groups. Sometimes they just need extra help in order to know what they're supposed to do next. And these issues are interrelated with all sorts of bigotry. It's not just white supremacy. Sometimes it can be religious extremist groups like ISIS. They recruit from people who are suffering and scared by offering them uh, religious supremacy. It can be misogynist groups like red pill groups or men's rights activists who believe that women shouldn't have the right to vote and that women should sit and be quiet and let the men make all the decisions. It can be groups, obviously, that are anti-Semitic that hate Jewish people, that are racist. It can be groups that um, hate the poor people, that are penurophobic, that are uh, out to commit hate crimes against homeless people. 
This isn't just a local issue. This isn't just something that happens in America. This isn't just something that happened hundreds of years ago. It's constant and it's ongoing because we all have the same brain. We all have similar genetics. And by understanding how our brains work and how our bodies work, we can understand how people could be led to commit these acts. And finally, bad things don't go away just because they are unpleasant to talk about. I wish we lived in a world where this wasn't an issue. We can continue to try to work against that, but what we can't do is bury our heads in the sand and pretend like none of this is ever going to happen or that nothing uh, is, it's not my problem. Because things don't get better and people get hurt when we don't try to fix our problems. I think of this poem uh, written by Martin Niemöller, uh, who was a pastor in Nazi Germany. He said, first they came for the socialists and I did not speak out because I was not a socialist. Then they came for the trade unionists and I did not speak out because I was not a trade uni unionist. Then they came for the Jews and I did not speak out because I was not a Jew. And then they came for me and there was no one left to speak for me. The world is a rough place. The only way that we are going to be able to get through it and make things better is together by working together to fix our problems. We have to do that. This is the end of the lecture part. But we have the assignment that I talked about, and we have some further resources that I want to point out. I'm going to include all of these in the description link so you can follow them there. They will also be available on Google Classroom. So for more reading, there are several cases that we can point out here. The top one is the Central Park Five. We also have stuff about Matthew Shepard, about James Byrd. We have things here uh, from PBS about the Emmett Till timeline and what happened with him. Finally, down below, we have a, an article about race and ethnicity as they relate to sundown towns, which was a very famous uh, or infamous, rather, American thing where people of different racial backgrounds were not allowed in a town after sundown. You can come here and you can work, you can travel through and get gas, but you better not stay and don't you dare try to move in. This is a whites only area. And some of the ways that that has been enforced and the ways that we tend to forgotten about that, even though it hasn't been that long since those were a thing. So what I want you to do for this assignment is you are going to pick one of these top four articles. This fifth one is a really good one, but it's hard to include in the assignment. I want you to read about it, and I want you to think about what we've done today as far as what has led people into extremist movements and to commit these hate crimes. And I want you to write a paragraph. You can write more if you want, but at least one paragraph. What is it that you think led to the acts that were committed and is there a way that you could think that these things could have been avoided through education, through programs, through whatever it is? What would be needed in order to reduce the risk of these? After all, that's our entire purpose here. And I don't expect you to solve everything. I don't expect you to solve all the world's problems. But this does give us a chance to think about what it would be, what, what are those things that we are worried about happening? How do we see them before it comes up? And what are some steps that we might be able to take that would help with the reduction here. All right, if you have questions, feel free to ask me. Otherwise, we will see you in class.